Good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Haggerty, and I'm Northwestern's provost, and I'm thrilled to be the host for today's discussion. This event is part of a larger series of um, celebrating the inauguration of Northwestern's 17th president, Michael Schill. Our guest of honor is seated right up in the front. So there's Mike. Let's give Mike a round of applause. So this is going to be a very special week. So earlier today, the Division of Student Affairs hosted Chill with Shill. Okay, so this is uh, a wellness-oriented study break for students wrapping up their academic quarter. There were crafts, activities, fitness classes, and games, and maybe the best part, they had mini horses, about this big, and dogs. And in particular, it included Northwestern's newest celebrity and an invaluable member of the Northwestern Central team, Mike's Dog Max. It was engaging and fun. On Thursday, I will host a second panel on the Evanston campus about academic freedom, free expression, and higher education. I hope some of you will be able to attend. Then on Friday, we will celebrate the formal installation of the president in his inaugural ceremony, and then celebrate together starting at 2 p.m. for a community gathering on the Norris East Lawn. Today's events focuses on the topic that demonstrates the impact that Northwestern researchers have on greater society, biomedical science and biomedical engineering. Northwestern scientists and clinicians are making breakthroughs on, that advance healthcare beyond the individual patient. This panel will explore those innovations and consider what the future holds for scientists working to enhance the quality of human life. Today's event is moderated by Eric Nielsen, the Lewis Landsberg Dean of the Feinberg School of Medicine, and will feature a fantastic lineup of our wonderful faculty experts, Guillermo Amir, Shana Kelly, Abel Coe, John Rogers, and Doug Bond. Please join me now in welcoming Dean Nielsen and our panelists. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we've been thinking about this uh, symposium for a while, and. Uh, what, what constitutes a new frontier in biomedical science or biomedical engineering, and I uh, thought the best way to uh, talk about this was to identify five distinguished scientists, both uh, uh, from Feinberg and McCormick and uh, Weinberg, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, some of the research areas that uh, they've been attracted to and to have sort of an informal discussion about what uh, the hot topics are in those areas. Uh, to my uh, right, your left, is uh, Doug Vaughn, who's the uh, Cutter Professor and Chair of the Department of Medicine and the Director of the Potosnack Longevity Institute. Uh, next to him is uh, Shauna Kelly, the Schwartz Professor of Chemistry, Biomedical Engineering, and uh, Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics. She's also the new president of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub in Chicago. To my left uh, is Abel Coe, professor of medicine and director for the Institute for Augmented Intelligence in Medicine. Uh, next to him is Guillermo Amir, Daniel Hale Williams, professor of biomedical engineering and surgery and director of the Center of it for Advanced Regenerative Engineering. And last, uh, at the end there is, uh, but not the least, John Rogers, Simpson Query Professor of uh, Material Sciences and Engineering, Dermatology and Neurosurgery, and Director of the Simpson Query Institute for Bioelectronics. So thank you all for, for being here today to talk about uh, some interesting uh, subject matter. Uh, Doug, maybe uh, we can begin uh, with you and um, we're going to sort of do this informally. Uh, there'll be an opportunity if the audience wants to ask questions at the end. Um, but uh, Doug, maybe you could, uh, uh, in your capacity as the director of the uh, Potosnack Longevity Institute, um, can you tell us uh, how long we're going to live? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we can today. If you come in through our Human Longevity Laboratory, we can do a variety of measures on you, and we can tell you uh, what day you're going to die and what you're going to die of. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty handy. Uh, <laughs> and how much is that evaluation? <laughs> For you, it's, we got a price. It's nominal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what are the real dimensions of this? How, how much can we really push 
human life and uh, obviously it's a balance of your genes and, and the environment to some extent or maybe to a great extent. What, what's the current thinking on that? Yeah, you're exactly right. We're, we're at a unique point and a convergence in human history where we, we have an understanding, a fundamental understanding of the biology of aging as well as an ability to precisely measure biological age. It, together, those give us an opportunity to potentially unravel this mystery that's, uh, you know, intrigued the human species since the beginning of, beginning of our time on this planet. Uh, the um, I think there's real evidence now that that it's possible to actually actually alter the pace of aging in uh, in human beings. The um, your genetics are important, but it's not the only factor. Uh, actually, epigenetics are probably more, a more important determinant of your aging and the velocity of aging, but there are lots of other factors too. The environment that you live in, uh, the food that you eat, uh, the, in, the uh, societal stresses that people face, they all impact upon the velocity of aging, and all those get integrated into a package into each of us that impacts upon our lifespan. And what do you mean by epigenetics being more important than your genes? Well, um, as many people in the audience know, maybe some don't know too, our, our, our DNA is alternatively chemically modified over our lifetimes. One component of that involves methylation of our DNA. That impacts upon the functionality of our DNA. And it turns out that there are very precise measures of your epigenetic age that be, be, be collected and analyzed. It's probably the gold standard for measuring biological age in mammalian species these days. It's a rapidly uh, evolving space. Uh, you know, don't blink. Next week there'll be a new version of one of these epigenetic uh, age determinator, determinants. But they, uh, the, the, the interesting thing is that it's it's not fixed in stone the way your DNA is. You don't have to undergo DNA editing to change your epigenome. You can change it by diet and exercise and probably drugs. And the fact that that is such a powerful marker, a driver of aging in all of us makes us think that if we change the epigenome, we can change your trajectory of aging if we want to. <laughs> I guess we're in Area 51 here, we have a visitor. Um, great, thanks, Doug. Uh, Shanna, um, can you tell us a little bit about the Biohub? I mean, the only thing most of us know is what's in the newspapers, and that's not very much. And um, I guess we'd be kind of interested to see how you're thinking about this and how it's going to evolve. Sure, well, I can give you the, the short version. So the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub uh, is a joint effort between Northwestern, the University of Chicago, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, these three great institutions came together uh, about a year ago and I'm looking around the room and I see a few people like Amy and, and John uh, Guillermo who uh, we're part of the group that came together, started brainstorming about ideas that we could put forward to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, who had the, this is a group uh, that is backed by Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, uh, now CEO of Meta. And so this group came together to respond to a call that the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative had put out to uh, have groups come forward to propose something called a biohub. A biohub is a freestanding, research institute that is partnered with three uh, research intensive universities. So we found our three uh, world-class institutions, came together, spent about a year thinking about you know, our, our strengths, how could we leverage them, how could we uh, show to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative that Chicago was the place for a new biohub. Uh, the initial biohub was actually in San Francisco. So we put a lot of work into that, went through a, a process where there were over uh, 150 universities that came forward, over 50 applications. Uh, we were successful with the proposal we put together. And uh, we were notified in February that we were the, the winner. Um, March, it was announced. April, I came on board as the president of the Biohub, and I, I think it's May, I'm not quite sure. It's been really busy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's May, almost June, and, uh, and we're launching. 
So this is going to be a, a scientific institute focused on engineering-driven approaches that will allow us to better understand inflammation and the function of the immune system. At a, a very basic level, we're going to be creating uh, engineered tissue mimics, also studying this in, in primary human tissues, and learning how to embed different kinds of sensors, sampling probes, fluidics into these tissue-based systems so that we can really watch the immune system at work. That's something that's difficult to do in a Petri dish because you need healthy tissue or diseased tissue, you need the immune system, you gotta watch all those things working together. It's also a difficult thing to study in animals because then you're studying animal inflammation instead of human inflammation. So we will have these new systems that will we'll get off the ground uh, when the biohub is fully scaled up. It'll be somewhere between 50 and 60 full-time people working away at the biohub on this. And uh, you know we'll be creating all kinds of, of new technologies, learning new things about biology, hopefully developing new diagnostics, new therapeutics that will allow us to get to this very basic driver of disease. You know, inflammation is linked with over 50% uh, of human deaths. It drives a vast majority of, of human diseases. And with this new set of, of systems that we'll be developing, we, we have just a, a completely different lens to look through to learn more about the, the biology there. So um, who, who exactly is going to do all this work? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Where are they going to be based, and how, how does the hub interface with the three institutions? Yeah, so the hub itself will be based in Fulton Market, so in Fulton Labs, which is a, a development that's uh, life sciences focused within uh, Fulton Market. So that's where we will be. And so there will be, as I said, 50 to 60 people working for the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub at that site. But the way that we'll continue partnering with the universities is the <clears throat> funds flow into the biohub. And this was about uh, $250 million that was given as a gift to be spent over uh, about 10 years. And then we may get some extensions beyond that. That $250 million comes into the biohub. And then a portion of it goes back out to the campuses of the universities who came together uh, as the, the biohub was uh, proposed. So we will be doing lots of cutting edge uh, research also on the campuses. We've already started that. We had a first kickoff meeting last Friday uh, for what we call our acceleration program, where we're getting these first engineered tissue systems off the ground. And so that, that work is already beginning. So work in the hub is going to be in competition with work in the three universities? Is not that, in is that competition. How you... Not at all well, in uh, competition. Very much in collaboration and with a great deal of synergy. We want people at the universities working closely with people at the Biohub and vice versa. We want people from the universities coming to the Biohub. We want people at the Biohub going to the universities and really facilitating cross-fertilization of ideas and technologies. And so uh, my hope and a big part of my job is making sure that it is very collaborative and that we keep the partnerships very strong. And um, will the... Um Hub be hiring their own scientists, their own senior scientists? Yes. And they'll want academic appointments, likely, or not? That's still to be worked out. In San Francisco, the people that work for the Biohub are Biohub employees, people at the universities, right. state at the universities. But uh, there's a master collaboration agreement which describes the way people can go back and forth and right. use the different facilities. Sort of so. like the Howard Hughes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Great. Um, well, besides the Biohub, you have another life as a scientist yourself, and um, you know, I know that you've been uh, particularly interested in um, isolating tumor infiltrating uh, lymphocytes and trying to think about how they can be used to affect the progress of therapy towards uh, certain clinical cancers and whatnot. Um, and I think you've even just started a company, if memory serves. Um, what is that all about? Yeah, so my research group at Northwestern combines engineering-based approaches, specifically microfluidics, where we're able to drive smaller amounts of fluid around uh, engineered devices and do different things to, to study biology. And recently, what we were able to do is find immune cells in the blood 
that are actually able to recognize and destroy cancer cells. And it's known that these, I mean, our immune system and our immune cells are constantly surveying the body, trying to figure out if there's a diseased tissue or maybe a cell that's turned cancerous. We know that immune cells eventually infiltrate into tumors, and then they're doing kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat, and they're trying to get rid of tumor cells. Um, but it had not been discovered previously that you could actually find these cells in the blood. And so that's where our analytical capabilities and uh, the engineering and the microfluidics came in and that we could comb through large uh, blood samples. We had to figure out what the signature was of a tumor reactive immune cell, but we did that showed that we could isolate these cells, we could expand them, we could multiply them. This was done in mice. We could send them back in and completely eradicate solid tumors with cells that we just pulled out of the blood. So uh, we did find a couple of venture capitalists that thought that this sounded like an interesting idea to be able to treat people with their own immune cells. And we've just launched a company that's incubating in, in Fulton Market and uh, you know we'll see uh, about getting that to the clinic. So it's, it's something I'm personally very excited about. What is the timeline to the clinic? Well, the timeline to the clinic, no matter what you're uh, pushing along, is, is long, right? It takes several years to do all of the preclinical mm -hmm. work so that you can go to the FDA and talk to them about what you want to do. So, you know, we're a few years away from a, a first in human or a phase one trial, but um, the approach uses cells that are not engineered. You're basically taking the cells out of somebody's body, out of a cancer patient's body, multiplying them up to the level you need for a dose, and sending them back in. So we're hoping that the, the hurdles with the FDA will be fairly, you know, as minimal as can be expected yeah. because the safety should be pretty good. Um, but obviously we gotta do all the, the work to, to demonstrate that before we can go into humans. Well, terrific. Um, Abel, uh, so you have been working in the uh, uh, augmented intelligence area for a while and, and leading our institute with colleagues in Evanston. Um, what are the exciting things going on in the Institute? Well, you know, um, one of the things that we've, we've all seen now, especially with tools like ChatGPT we've all seen, is the, is the amazing potential for these new technologies, uh, the ability for them to enhance the way we communicate with each other and how we can actually interact with data. And so the Institute actually is focused right now on uh, taking all this, these different products and byproducts of research that we're generating, all these different new data sources, and combining them in novel ways to come up with, for example, new ways of diagnosing diseases. So one of the exciting things that we're looking at is, uh, and Dr. Sanjeev Shah is doing really exciting work in this deep phenotyping space, is we typically think of, or have traditionally thought of diseases being sort of like. What does deep phenotyping mean? I'm confused yeah, like, already. Sure, sure. So, so for example, like a, a phenotype uh, is similar to like a disease. Let's say it's as similar as to a disease. And people oftentimes think of a disease as being singular, like there's diabetes or there's heart failure. Well, it turns out that if you combine multiple different sources of data, like data from electronic health records, genetic data, things like epigenetic data, for example, you can find subtypes of diseases, like multiple different, more specific types of disease that might be relevant for the person sitting in front of you. And that's relevant because then you can actually precisely target therapeutics that would affect that person in front of you. And that's one of the real potential benefits of these much more sort of combinations of data. That's it? <laughs> well, there's, there's a lot. <laughs> well, obviously, there's a lot of other issues that come up with working with large amounts of data. And I think the other thing that's really important to think about is that while there are large technology companies which can do things like build these large language models, because they have access to all these different data sets, there are other considerations, like what are the implications from a legal aspect, what are the implications from an ethical aspect, or implications from a bias aspect. Those are really, really important considerations for any novel and potentially uh, transformative technology. And those are important things that various groups, like our center focused on ethics are working on, folks in our library group are working on. Uh, these are things that I think universities are ideally positioned to try to address, it's not just necessarily building these larger and larger models, but how do you actually responsibly apply those? And is there a role for them in medicine? Absolutely. You mean these new technologies, yeah. for example? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, anytime you're taking a new technology, I think people think it's oftentimes about bigger and bigger is better. But 
One of the advantages of working within a healthcare environment, we have the ability to actually tailor these technologies to this environment. And I think that's really where a lot of the hard work has to happen. So how do you responsibly apply those within these environments? How do you uh, teach these tools to be effective within the specialized space that we work in? And how do you adapt it to the workflows that fill our day? And especially things like some of the mundane work that many of our clinicians engage in, you know, note taking and note writing and sort of uh, first line interactions around insurance coverage, those sorts of things. Those are real opportunities, I think, to take technology and make our lives as clinicians much better and much more efficient. And I think that's an area that we, we are really excited to try to do, to not only bring these technologies in, but also make the lives of the people working with them better. Well, I think it's uh, been said, and I have to, I think, assume that's true, uh, that what's, what the knowledge that's already out there in the internet is much, much larger than the capacity of the human brain to process and handle today. And so uh, many of the WAGs in this area are saying it won't be too long before, you know, uh, the computers themselves will be learning more than we are and making um, advances in uh, whatever society they choose to set up. Yeah, I, I <laughs> and, think that... Uh, <laughs> and, uh, what does that look like and how far off the mark are, are these uh, uh, individuals who are predicting the future? Well, I think that's what we read because I think it makes, makes for good news. Uh, but the reality is that medicine is incredibly complex. People are highly unpredictable and, and new things come into our clinic every day. You know, we see new types of, uh, of, uh, of interactions. We have new data sources that are com constantly coming online. There's an increasing recognition that social determinants make a difference. So it's, it's until you start weaving all those novel sources in that you really can realize the full value. And that's not going to be something that's going to you know, be, be you know, automatically generated from large technology companies, but it's going to be in that tailoring around specific use cases we're going to really see the, the value add. And, and I think that's, uh, that's a place, again, where we can, we can really uh, contribute. Is it likely that uh, the... Um the knowledge that's created by these large language uh, uh, systems are, it really has a market for, for sale, or is it going to be pretty much um, something that uh, has to be given away pretty quickly because people will find a way in? Uh, well, certainly there's a huge amount of, uh, of commercial interest in the application of large language models. I mean, if you look at, uh, while investments in a lot of technology has sort of diminished in the past year or so, what you've seen is a rapid increase in companies that are enabling the use of this technology. Um, but uh, ideally, there is going to be some of this available that's not just for those who can afford it, but will be made available to a wider audience, whether that be uh, free or or in some way that's supported through, for example, uh, government sources. But you'd certainly want to make sure that technologies like this are available to everybody. Great. Well, Guillermo, um, you're an engineer, and your uh, background is in regenerative medicine. Um, maybe you could explain to the audience what regenerative medicine is, and uh, where is it going? Sure, yes. Uh, so. As you said, my background is in, in, in chemical engineering, and biomedical engineering, and I was never really interested in you know, doing uh, chemical distillation or synthesis in, in large you know, factories or manufacturing facilities at, at Exxon. But my interest was more in how can we use uh, some of the concepts and the skills that we learned in, in, as, as engineers <clears throat> and apply those to improve the technology that we have available or we could have available to improve the outcomes of surgeries. Uh, so regenerative medicine was this very exciting area that emerged a few decades ago where you, you had this, this promise of using uh, uh, pr proteins or other types of molecules to help your body's tissues or components uh, regenerate. So for example, if you had a heart attack, you know, they'll give you a stem cells of some sort or some type of cell therapy to help regenerate that, in, in that, uh, that damaged area of the heart. If you had broken bones, they would give you, instead of a plastic uh, prosthetic or metal prosthetic, they'll try to give you something that would eventually become bone and so forth. Uh, this was a very exciting era for, for a long time. Of course, it's had its ups and downs. 
But what has been fascinating is that, you know, most for, historically most of it relied on the biology and maybe some of the biochemistry, more of the, uh, the life sciences side of, 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 of wisdom or knowledge, not so much engineering. But uh, within the last, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say two decades and a half, three decades or so, we saw engineers step in and demonstrate that uh, by bringing fields that are disparate to what you would think is compatible with life and medicine and so forth, by bringing them into the picture, we're now able to significantly improve the chances of getting these types of therapies and make them reality. So regenerative medicine, right now, to be, the way I see it, I give talks, is more of a, an academic field, perhaps. There aren't that many products out there. If you go to the doctor, you have a torn ACL or a torn ligament, they're not gonna give you a tissue engineered one, for example. You're not gonna get you know, that tissue engineered tendon, or not yet, anyways. But uh, the future is that by bringing in engineers and other types of scientists into the equation, uh, uh, we can get to that point where we can realize the full potential of, of regenerative medicine. That area is a new area called regenerative engineering, which is very exciting. It's a new field that, that uh, is a convergence discipline that brings material sciences, uh, stem cell and developmental biology, uh, physical sciences, and translational medicine together in a deeply integrated manner to solve these types of problems. The, um, and I just pick on organ tissues, for example, but they, they've had a clearly uh, well-documented and highly structured uh, developmental life in their formation. And there are all kinds of uh, biochemical and genetic decisions that were made along the way to do or not do this or that in creating these tissues. Um, how are we going to do that from uh, a 3D printed uh, scaffold that uh, is waiting for some cells to fall upon it and reform these kind of What's going to drive that? How does that work? Yeah, the morphogenesis and the, 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 the signaling and the communication between cells is all very compl complex. So uh, we, we can learn from developmental biology, perhaps, you know, how things mature uh, in, in the womb, for example. But I think when it comes to products, you have a whole different area of complications and, and, and issues with, that have to do with scale up manufacturing and quality systems, right? Uh, it has to be as reliable as your phone. When we make a phone call, we don't think about how that call is going to go through, whether or not it's going to happen or not. You just assume it's going to happen. You make your phone call. So there, there are, are issues that are relevant to the actual uh, translational components to this. So what, we, what I tend to do in, in my work and at the center and, and with my collaborators, Professor Rogers is one of those, we tend to focus on the low-hanging fruit, where we can show proof of concept. So uh, in, in fact, what we do with the 3D printing, for example, we don't start to print the full tissues yet. We want to show that we can print devices that can help guide the tissue that's already there and to not become pro-inflammatory, not becoming scar tissue, for example. So we can print devices that are, quote unquote, we call them smart regenerative systems. They will be, they'll be able to instruct your body not to reject them in a particular way. So those we 3D print now, we can design those uh, features into the printed device and then we've seen now in trials, preclinical studies in, in swine, for example, that in the case of stents, cardio cardiovascular stents, we can do a lot better than the traditional metal drug eluting stents. So that's an example of how we want to start, uh, again, demonstrating that we can make materials that can help your own body and your own tissue uh, do better than what we can do with current traditional devices. Next step would be the addition of cell types from different sources, but that gets a lot more complicated. In fact, we have institutes, as you know, nation, nationwide institutes funded by the government with a lot of industry support. Army is an example of that. And, and they're trying to figure it out. How do we manufacture cell-based tissue, cell-based products in a reliable way? And then you will use that as your source to, 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 a, to a 3D printer, potentially, to then print a, a tissue. Maybe simple tissues like skin. I don't want to call skin simple. Forgive me, Amy. But uh, the, the skin is an example for the biohub that we proposed as well as a way to, as a model system to understand the complexities that, that are involved in here. So that, that's my, my, my view on that. It, it seems to me that you know, each of us are, are, so, genetic, are so genetically and, and anagenically different that um, all of this regeneration either has to be done inside the body or a tissue prepared in culture has to be from the cells and, and, uh, and uh, products of the individual that it's going to be placed in. 
That's, that's right, a customized medicine. Uh, we can get cells from the patient, the potential, the potential person that's gonna receive the, the, the treatment. We can grow those cells. In fact, we have a project where we get urine-derived stem cells. So imagine a future where you could, you could this is for the soldiers, for example. You could, every person could get a pee sample. Uh, you have it stored, you collect those progenitor cells, and God forbid and there's an, an injury or something severe where they need this uh, to, uh, type of uh, uh, regenerative therapies. We can use those cells as a source for that patient, that person, so we don't have to worry about rejection or immune issues that are traditionally associated with, uh, with donor cells or, donor or, or xenogenic or animal sources. Mm -hmm. So that's an example where we can do specific customized uh, strategies. We can get skin cell samples, turn those skin cell samples into a particular, into something more plastic, uh, more of a stem-like phenotype. And then we can then coerce that to become a target cell, perhaps a heart cell, a skin cell, a kidney cell, and so forth. So I think that part of the problem is there's a lot of work being done there. Now we need to think about how do we package these cells? What's the environment that we need to provide for these cells in order to deliver them back into the body? And this is where regenerative engineering is, is very exciting. Great. <clears throat> well, John, um, is, is, does bioelectronics have a future? <laughs> trying to create one, yeah. So <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I'll say a few more words about that, but, but let me start by just, um, you know, expressing my, um, you know, pleasure at being part of this panel uh, and, you know, kind of share the stage here with these incredible scientists and, and doctors and, um, and you too, Eric, as well. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I see a lot of collaborators out there in the audience. I'm a little bit blinded, but I see Amy Poller and Lorenzo Galan. And so, um, so bi bioelectronics is, is kind of a, an emerging area of, uh, of engineering. And um, you, know, you introduced Guillermo as an engineer. I'm a real engineer, because I, I, I bring toys. You don't have any toys, right? So, so I, 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 I'm, I do har hardware development. And um, you know, try, try to you know, create this new field of electronics. It's, you know, radically different from the kind of integrated circuits and electronics that most of you are familiar with, the, you know, microchips that, that form the, the guts of your smartphone and, and your laptop computer and really, you know, support functionality on all sorts of uh, consumer electronics gadgetry. But, but trying to think about that electronics reformulated uh, to be compatible with, with biology, with, with the human body, but more generally with, with living organisms. Uh, soft, flexible forms of electronics that can softly integrate on the surfaces of soft living tissues or permeate down into its depths to you know, form an intimate physical uh, interface that, that can be stable over long periods of time and support kind of two-way information exchange. So the biology can interact with the electronics, the electronics with the biology. That's kind of the, the grand vision to kind of blur the distinction between biology uh, and electronics with, with the goal of trying to develop new platforms that can be used to develop uh, new insights into fundamental processes in, in biological systems as, as research tools, but then ultimately as new uh, platforms for clinical medicine and, and patient care to try to you know, improve outcomes and, and reduce costs. And uh, a number of different formulations of, of, of bioelectronics, different examples of, of those kinds of technologies. And I bought three here just to kind of give you a sense of it. Uh, one uh, involves a very thin, almost down to like, you know, temporary tattoo type form factor devices that, that can integrate with the surfaces of, of organs of the human body. Uh, our focus has been, you know, kind of on the skin where you can exploit that physical interface between these soft, flexible devices and, and the skin to really quantitate, uh, you know, aspects of underlying physiological processes and, and, and do that in a way that's cost effective without uh, wired tethers to external you know, electronic uh, data recording systems and, and can be deployed kind of in the field in remote settings without um, you know, uh, trained technician support. So this particular device is designed to uh, mount on the chest and it does ICU grade monitoring of cardiopulmonary sign signatures of health status. So the kinds of things you would see in an ICU 
ICU, but now, you know, in a patch type format that can be continuously monitoring the, these parameters. And we talked about uh, AI approaches really to develop the data streams that could feed into those machine learning, you know, algorithms to, to track health status, not in an episodic way, the way that it's done today where, you know, sick patients present to a hospital, but in a way that's really continuously tracking health to pick up very early signs of uh, you know, health disorders so, so that uh, physicians can engage at the, those early time points to be, be most effective. So, so these kinds of, of devices represent one area of our, our focus and you know, it involves deep collaborations across the medical complex here, across Feinberg, but also Lurie Children's and Princess Women's, NMH, Shuri Ryan Ability Lab. So it's really a tremendous environment that, that we have here. So these, these devices sort of measure kind of vital signs uh, that, that are captured in, in an ICU setting. Uh, deployable not only in sort of developed areas of the globe, but also lower and middle income countries. So we have programs at the Gates Foundation, the Save the Children organization. These are deployed at a scale of about 10,000 devices in uh, Kenya, uh, Kenya uh, Zambia, Ghana, India, Pakistan, and Mexico, for, for example. So thinking about global health challenges that could be addressed by, by, by new technologies. Th this platform is, is um, you know, uh, has integrated a collection of sort of biophysical sensors of, of health processes, so measuring electrical activity associated with cardiac cycles, sounds associated with opening and closing of valves in the heart, the flow of air in and out of the lungs, temperature sensors to really you know, track uh, subtle changes in, in temperature that can be you know, important physical uh, motions and so on. But ultimately, if you want to capture, you know, a detailed picture of an individual's health status, you'd like to be able to, um, you know, track biomarker uh, 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 concentrations and, and fluctuations as well. And that's tr traditionally done with uh, blood and interstitial fluid, in certain cases saliva. But, but we've been interested in developing similar soft sort of skin compatible devices that embed microfluidic technologies capable of capturing very tiny volumes of sweat as it emerges from the surface of the skin uh, due to the action of the eccrine uh, sweat glands and sort of route that sweat into a collection of microfluidic channels and valves and reservoirs. We have color changing chemical reagents that allow us to measure biomarker concentrations in sweat. Uh, and that turns out to be another kind of form of um, bioelectronics, but where the emphasis is on microfluidics uh, would, would be an example. Two more, uh, just to give you a flavor of the, of the breadth of what we're talking about here. We're also interested in devices that implant into the body, not just sitting on the surface of the skin. It's a great starting point because it's highly non-invasive, low risk type of uh, you know, patient uh, interface. But, but ultimately, we'd like to take those same ideas and leverage them for advanced implantable systems that would offer functionality that go be far beyond a pacemaker, for example, where the electronics themselves are integrated with the soft tissues of, of the internal organs rather than just point contact electrode leads. And, and one example of that is uh, in optoelectronics. So not only you know, integrated circuits, but, but devices that emit light or are able to detect light. And so this is a, a particular class of device that we've been interested in. These are the world's smallest um, LEDs. So they're about the size of an individual neuron and they're designed to uh, implant down into the depth of the brains of animals that are genetically modified to have light sensitive neurons. Uh, and so we can use these extremely tiny LEDs to light up different neural circuits within the brain. And we can look at how that um, stimulation or inhibition of neural activity changes the behavior of the animals as a way to begin to dissect and unravel the basic operating principles of the brain. And so these kinds of technologies extend beyond just monitoring to uh, you know, platforms that have neuromodulatory uh, capabilities as well, just to kind of, kind of give you a, a flavor of you know, uh, other, other kinds of things. And, and, and one more example uh, is in devices that uh, are uniquely defined by their ability to uh, dissolve harmlessly in biofluids. And so you think about a resorbable suture as kind of an interesting medical technology. It provides a pretty simple mechanical function, sort of holding wounds, uh, you know, uh, closed as, as they heal and then ultimately resorb after they're no longer needed so they don't need to be, you know, uh, removed and, and expose patient risk to that kind of removal process. Well, as material scientists, we've been able to put together a complete collection of electronic materials. So 
conductors, semiconductors, insulators that can be used to build advanced digital integrated circuits and sensors and radios and power supplies and so on that have that same feature like a resorbable suture that uh, can support functional operation over a time period uh, aligned to a natural biological process and then simply dissolve and melt away in the body without uh, any harmful effect on the patient, thereby eliminating the, the need for a surgical extraction procedure. And this is an example of that, that kind of technology. It's actually a temporary wireless pacemaker. And so we've been working on this technology. We were contacted by some of the cardiac surgeons here, here at Feinberg, and they uh, asked us if we were able to sort of adapt our bioresorbable electronics to provide that kind of temporary uh, pacemaking functionality, which is evidently uh, kind of a standard of care for patients who've run, undergone a very invasive, um, you know, say open heart uh, surgery. They, they place a temporary pacemaker in those patients so that the heart rate can be uh, paced up to a normal sort of healthy level in the event that, uh, you know, the, the, the heart rate uh, decreases to dangerous levels during that recovery period. But then once the patients are recovered, you don't need that pacing functionality anymore. And so this kind of device just disappears and uh, eliminates the need for that kind of extraction process that's currently used for uh, non-resorbable uh, temporary pacemakers. So, so it's a pretty broad, broad field, uh, integrating a number of different traditional disciplines within uh, engineering, material science being, being prominent among those. That's my kind of home department, like core expertise in electronic materials, but also bio, biomedical uh, engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical, computer science, but, but really intimately uh, engaging with the clinical community. I think that that, that's uh, you know one of mo the most important things. As an engineer, you'd like to develop new technologies, but those that are addressing real clinical needs and fit into a clinical workflow at a cost point that, that kind of makes sense. And working with clinicians, physicians, nurses especially, turns out to be an important part of uh, you know the, the kind of research that we do. The um, these sensors uh, that we're putting inside this sea within us because it's a, a vast electrolyte sea uh, 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 in each of us. Um, how do you prevent these sensors from shorting out? Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. So, so the, these devices, they mount on the skin. Uh, they're just encapsulated with a, uh, a biocompatible formulation of a silicone right. elastomer polymer. And so they're to first order waterproof, you can take a shower with these devices on, um, these sweat collecting devices. We've actually deployed them on swimmers with the uh, Northwestern team, so you can monitor sweat loss while you're in the pool swimming. It's difficult to do that you know, any, any other way. So, so the, those uh, devices can be encapsulated and, and they uh, operate fa fairly well in those kinds of contexts. I think uh, biofluids and the environment within, within the body is much more challenging because you're not just immersed in, uh, you know, um, an aqueous environment, but, but you're also immersed in a biological system that in many cases it's attacking your device uh, aggressively. Exactly. So yeah. it's, a, it's a whole nother uh, you know, level of, of challenge. And so um, it really depends on uh, the nature of the device and its engagement uh, with the surrounding uh, tissues. A lot of what we do is based on these kind of biophysical me mechanisms that I was mentioning before. So a thermal type of sensing mechanism or an optical approach to stimulation or, or sensing, Th those kinds of techniques are relatively robust to the formation of biofilms or fibrotic capsules because you, you can sense right through them and you can engineer your system to, to uh, you know, perform that measurement kind of at a distance beyond, beyond the encapsulating uh, films. I think for biochemical sensors, much more challenging because there all of the sensing action is happening right on the surface of, of, of the sensor itself. And so that, that uh, kind of immune response can cause uh, drifts in the sensor performance and can be very difficult to, uh, to deal with. So it's probably an area of active research is kind of you know, developing more, more stable biochemical sensors that can survive as, as implants. Well, um, do any of these sensors require fuel? Yeah, they, they all require some supply of, of power. Uh, with the exception of the microfluidic uh, sweat capturing devices, there we just exploit the, power, the pumping mechanism associated with the eccrine sweat glands themselves. That's the source of power and sort of moving the fluid through the structure, which is otherwise uh, completely passive. 
in its uh, operation. But, but all the other devices, the LED devices, the, the pacemaker uh, device, they're, they're all you know, electrically powered in one way or another. Um, one scheme to do that is to do um, electromagnetic energy harvesting. And so for these, these devices, these cellular scale implantable LEDs, we just des design them to um, receive uh, wireless power from a transmission source, a uh, radio frequency source of, of power. And so one kind of standard for smartphone technology is NFC, uh, and so it's uh, high frequency RF, 13.56 megahertz, and so you can uh, transfer via magnetic inductive coupling power from an externally powered antenna into a device that's implanted in the body. That particular frequency uh, regime happens to be attractive because it's not absorbed by uh, biological tissues or uh, a water environment. So that works for the, these kind of implantable LEDs. The devices that we've uh, developed for wireless vital sign sensing in the neonatal intensive care unit and the pediatric intensive care unit can be operated with the same mechanism. So there you can uh, wrap an antenna around the base of the isolate and get kind of coverage through that entire volume, thereby eliminating the need for the, the bulk and the size and the weight and the health risks, quite frankly, associated with a battery that you can incorporate in the device as an alternative source of power. But I think maybe more aggressive sort of options that, that are still you know, underdeveloped from a, re from a research <coughs> standpoint would be to um, harvest um, you know, power that's um, present uh, naturally uh, you know, with, within the body, associated with mechanical motions, for example. You can develop piezoelectric uh, devices that, that can convert mechanical motions into electrical power, uh, and that's something that, that we're working on. You can also consider biofuel cells that would operate on glucose that's, that's present uh, within uh, biofluids in, in, in the body is another way to, to do it. Ultrasound is another kind of wireless way to transmit power from, from outside the body to an, to an internal uh, implant. So a num number of different options. Some of them are kind of ready to go now and serve as the basis of FDA-approved devices that I mentioned before that we're deploying at scale into lower and middle, middle income countries. Others are just emerging now from uh, research activities in our labs and, and, and others around the world. Thanks, John. <clears throat> so, Dr. Vaughn, um, <clears throat> uh, how accurate is the grim age clock? <clears throat> and uh, what is it? I, the grim age clock is, is very accurate uh, in terms of determining biological age. It's, uh, it's uh, readily available. It's pretty easy to perform. It's not particularly expensive to do the analysis, and it, it is included as part of the package of, of the indices that we measure in our human longevity laboratory here. And what does it tell you? Why is it called the Grim Age? <laughs> <laughs> well, the investigators at UCLA that discovered it, it was a little bit tongue-in-cheek uh, because they really did arrive on an algorithm and a, a series of, of um, uh, GPC sites across the genome that that represent uh, an index of, of your biological age. So it predicts uh, morbidities, aging-related morbidities, the development of heart failure, heart attacks, neurodegeneration, development of lung disease, development of cancer, uh, age of menopause, you want me to go on? There are all kinds of things that it, that they, it predicts rather, rather accurately and rather precisely. And, um, you know, it's the gold standard today, but it may not be the gold standard Five years from now, you know, a few years ago, it was your telomere length. That's almost disappeared now. Yeah. So the, the, the field is moving very rapidly. But, but together with molecular indices of biological age and physiological indices, I think we, could, we can come up with a very, very accurate picture of, of the biological age of a human being. You know, on our own campus, we have investigators that have found new molecular indices that reflect biological age, like the, uh, your transcriptome length, tends to deteriorate as we age. Or we, we, we tend to be able to transcribe shorter genes rather than longer genes. And that is another incredibly powerful and robust marker of your biological age. And again, it appears to be malleable. Um, so, so what happens when you visit this human longevity lab that you keep talking about? Are you blindfolded, or is there uh, something special that happens there? Eric, we have some very pragmatic goals here. Uh, you know, we're, we're our, as a physician, I'm struck uh, when I walk through the hospital, I see people that are aging too rapidly. 
and it affects all kinds of people and impacts on the human condition. We have patients with uh, chronic kidney disease, people with chronic HIV infections, they age more rapidly and they develop age-related diseases more rapidly. Our our, one of our primary goals of the Human Longevity Laboratory is to find some help for those kinds of populations, people that are aging too rapidly, see if we can slow that down and ex actually extend their health span. I'm not too interested in, in uh, trying to uh, find a way to keep a member of our species alive for 150 years. There are people that talk about that. Uh, that's not our goal. Our goal is much more pragmatic. It's much more humane, I think. But <clears throat> age is the key driver of disease. And if we can just slow down the aging process a little bit in everyone, and particularly in people that are aging too rapidly, we can slow down or prevent the onset of aging-related disease and give people a longer health span. Thanks. Uh, Sh Shana, um, you know, I think one of the things that we've sort of learned this afternoon is that uh, being able to um, phenotype and describe an individual's cell uh, very specifically is going to become increasingly more important, and I know that's something that you've been thinking a lot about. Um, how do you, how do you, how are you thinking about approaching the single cell phenotyping that's going on today? Yeah, it goes back to the platform that I mentioned briefly on the the last round, uh, where we have these microfluidic devices that that basically look at one cell at a time as they're coming through. It could be a blood sample or a piece of a tumor that we've dissociated or some other interesting biological sample. And we have built systems, I mean, the way that John builds his bioelectronic devices, we build microfluidic devices and uh, single cell analysis devices so that with a very high level of performance and throughput, we can bring cells through, we can understand whether a cell is healthy, diseased, maybe some, a, immune cell that can kill a tumor cell or some other uh, interesting type of, of activity. And we've learned how to do that with a billion cells in an hour. And it's that, that's the level, that level of throughput allows us to do things that other people haven't been able to do. For example, sorting through a milliliter of blood, looking at all billion normal blood cells that could be in that sample and, and finding just these very rare subpopulations of cells that could have therapeutic activity. So that's why we're very interested in further developing that capability. It just allows us to, to do things, make measurements that haven't been made before, learn things about biology, develop new therapies and, and new diagnostics. So that's, that's been a, a big emphasis for us over the last decade or so, given all the applications. Great. Uh, Abel, um, can you talk a little bit about how uh, Feinberg's collaborating with our colleagues at NMHC and Evanston to yeah. work on some of these challenges in augmented intelligence? Well, certainly uh, you may remember when we first met and talked about this, I, I said that we would only make this work if we, we had a, a strong uh, uh, you know, collaboration between those three legs of the stools, the NM and and uh, Evanston and, uh, and FSM. And, and I think this is a good example of this panel. Uh, I think uh, innovation is very much uh, a team sport. Uh, it's very much something that uh, does best when you have multiple disciplines coming together and looking across, uh, looking at a problem from different viewpoints. And, and so we've been very fortunate to have uh, amazing collaborators at the hospital, uh, who obviously is one of the biggest sources of the clinical data that we use. Uh, and they've been, uh, you know, through their, uh, uh, you know, enterprise data warehouse and efforts as, uh, like that. Uh, with McCormick, I think there's been a number of great collaborators who have been helping us with training. And so there's a very robust uh, training program. We have a master's in AI, which has been a huge success. And primarily cardiologists, but we're expanding to other disciplines, which has been uh, really uh, very strong. Then many of us have our own collaboration, our own projects. Uh, you know, myself, I've been working on uh, with Jenny Rogers and Xiao Wang up in uh, McCormick for now it's been seven years, you know, funded by NSF and, you know, uh, we've been working on ways to bring data together across multiple different in institutions or across schools in ways that protect privacy. And that's uh, sort of an under, sort of appreciated uh, challenge, I think, in dealing with these large data sets. The more data you have together, the more there are risks to privacy and, and only through these collaborations are we able to address that problem effectively. And, and we've come up with methods which we now think are uh, widely uh, applicable, can be used across many different uh, problems. 
Uh, and in fact, we are already deploying that now across many places here in Chicago. And so do you actually physically see your collaborators or do you just absolutely so GPT, you know so. before the pandemic i was spending a day a week up on, on uh, up in mccormick on wednesdays i'd sit there they give me a uh, i guess a swing space to sit in and mm -hmm. and uh, that was tremendous because you'd be able to see the seminar series and watch those and and just see how people look at problems differently uh the pandemic made it a little tricky to hop on the bus and get up there but but we've uh, still continued to sort of uh now by bike uh, go back and forth and and still meet up on a regular basis. It's really important. I think the face-to-face -face part, you know, the, the irony of all this is that technologies have sort of forced us more to actually work more and do the things we do well, which is actually interact with other people. And so we're doing a lot more of that than, than ever. Great. Uh, Guillermo, um, what are uh, some of the things we need to do to advance regenerative medicine at Northwestern? So I, I believe uh, people are the key here. Uh, we have great infrastructure. We've uh, done amazing things with, with our equipment, our, our buildings, our facilities. But I think bringing the best of the best in these areas is how we, we, would do, we will do that. We want people to want to come to Northwestern, not to the either coast. Nothing that is wrong with the beaches. I like the beaches. But uh, lakes are fine, too, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think uh, investing in, 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 the, in the people I want to come to join this group, join this sort of camaraderie, this, this integration of the different disciplines, and really truly believe in that. That's the way to move forward. And I know recently we talk a lot about diversity and equity and inclusion, and there's a lot of discussion about why we're doing this. And I, I, say, I say it's a necessity. We're doing this out of need, not because it's the right thing to do, but it's the thing we should and we have to do if we want to remain competitive. So uh, that's number one. Let's bring the best and the brightest here, and let's keep them here. We don't want to grow them here, bring them here for them to leave. It does not help us, right? So if we, if we uh, I think if we do that, we bring people in the right different areas of regenerative medicine. We, we need the, the surgeons. I collaborate with lots of surgeons, like craniofacial surgeons, cardiovascular orthopedics, uh, urologist uh, with Lurie Children's Hospital, uh, with Dr. Pollard uh, with skin. But you, you need you know, the clinician scientists or the, the, the doctors that are willing to do this sort of collaborative work we need the engineers, such as John, myself, and others here. Uh, chemists, I see Chad is in the, it's kind of blinding with the sun here, but <laughs> I think uh, you know, we need the engineers and the scientists to be open-minded, right? Open-minded about wanting to learn the language and understand what are the real needs. I say uh, the, the mother of invention is necessity. Uh, things come out of necessity, and I think by having these different ingredients, that willingness to collaborate, that infrastructure, and, and bringing the best and the brightest from wherever, whatever background it might be, it's a way to move forward. Great. Well, John, we're almost out of time, but um, so do you have any competition out there? Is the market? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <It's done. laughs> uh, the market seems to be fairly nascent at this point. Uh, um, what is the competition telling you about what you need to do better and faster? Yeah, we always worry about the competition, I guess. Um, I think of it as kind of two buckets. One would be kind of competition at the level of academic research in this space, who's defining the frontier, who's most productive. Um, I think that, you know, Stanford has, has, a, has a really impressive um, center. It's called eWare, so it's drawing faculty from a number of different departments. They, they're doing very well. Um, Caltech launched a new department in what they call medical engineering. And so distinct from biomedical engineering in the sense it's very much clinical, uh, clinically focused and, and, and a real overarching um, you know, mission around translation. So Caltech is another one. Um, Harvard has the, the Wies uh, Institute, which is also very, very translational, very active in this space. And so Every year is a part, part of the reporting requirements uh, for, for our institute, we, we do benchmarking. So we look at various kinds of metrics, right? Numbers of publications, numbers of citations, number of papers in the most competitive journals. And I don't know, you take a look at it. You know, some would say we're kicking their asses. I would never, I would never say that. I would never say that myself, but some might. Um, so anyway, it's good. I think I think we're in a good good spot. But but they're they're doing great work too. I don't want to, you know, denigrate anything. They have great great efforts. And and then kind of kind of from the um, translational side, you know, uh, commercialization of this stuff is kind of the ultimate goal. I, sure. mean, I think you want to publish in great journals and 
there's a really you know important educational part of, of what we do and the students tend to be you know highly motivated about activities that have the potential to impact human health so I think that's that's uh, an important piece but ultimately you'd like to get things out of the lab if that doesn't happen then you know kind of it, it sort of sort of you know, you'd have to question what, what the point of all of this is. And so you think about from a commercial standpoint, I think most of the innovation is happening in startups. And so um, activities in neurotechnologies are particularly hot right now. Elon Musk's Neuralink, for example. Synchron is one that's supported by Bezos and, and Gates. Uh, there's some other companies, one out of Stan, uh, Stanford, Pyramids, looks pretty impressive, and um, BioBeats is their Israeli company. So you kind of keep tabs on this. I think there's a lot of momentum. It's you know broad, broad community effort. We're trying to find our spots, but, but I think there's, there's a lot of innovation going on, a lot of promise for this kind of thing. Terrific. Well, I think this is, uh, draws a, a, a close to our uh, hour, and uh, I want to thank all of you for coming. There's a reception outside. For those of you who can stay and uh, get a chance to talk to some of our superb uh, talent here uh, on the podium, again, let's give our, our participants a round of applause. Thank you very much.